Hello, and welcome back to the Modern DTNI. In this series of videos, we're going to take a look at how the Modern DTNI came to be. We'll start with the Henry Ford era and work our way up to the early 2010s where the layout is currently set. Along the way, we'll look at some operations, acquisitions, sale of the line to and from DTW and Canadian National, and the current company. Please note that although based in history and current railroad operations, this railroad story is fictional. You'd be really surprised how often I receive a message asking about right-of-way access. There will be differences throughout the narrative from history, but rest assured I do know the real story. This one is just mine. Henry Ford bought the DTNI, which was then a collection of smaller short lines, in 1920. He promptly brought the line into top-notch shape and began a flow of traffic that continues to this day. Ford held control of the DTNI until 1942, at which time control was given to a Pennsylvania Railroad subsidiary. Ford did remain on the advisory board until his death in 1947. Under Ford's ownership and direction, three massive new projects were undertaken. The Malinta Cutoff, rebuilding Royalsville Tunnel, and easing the climb over Summit Hill. These projects eliminated several pain points for the railroad and standardized clearances and weight limits across the entire system. Ford's end goal was to build a new line from Ironton through West Virginia and meet up with the Virginian Railroad for a unified, electrified route directly from Detroit to the Virginia ports. Although Ford died before achieving this goal, the railroad still formed a close relationship with the Virginian, which is still evident in today's coal operations in the area. Since actual history is mostly the same as my concept history under the Pennsylvania ownership, we'll skip ahead to 1980, when the Conrail merger from a few years prior forced the sale of the line. Enter Grand Trunk Western. The GTW owned the DTNI from 1980 through 1997. From 1980 through about 1996, the road remained largely independent. Thus, the 1980s saw some expansion of the road. Also during this time, the GTW itself became part of an expanding Canadian National North America. Several DTNI locomotives were repainted into the black, red, and white CN scheme, but retained their DTNI Star logo as a subsidiary railroad. One of the biggest acquisitions of the DTNI's history occurred under GTW ownership. This is the purchase of the BNO's Ohio division and several CNO branch lines from the Chessie system. This included trackage from Clarksburg, West Virginia to Cincinnati, Ohio, and the CNO's branch from Columbus, Ohio to Athens where it connected to the Ohio division. Trackage rights were granted on the Chessie's Midland subdivision from Washington Courthouse into Cincinnati, giving the DTNI a bit of a longer run than the former Conrail routing. Interchange with the NNW was moved from Waverly to Chillicothe and also Ironton, and the DTNI between Jackson and Washington Courthouse was converted into a tourist line subsidiary called the Summit Hill Scenic Railway. The line is maintained for local business and a local runs each way daily. In 1997, the DTNI again found itself as an independent line. CN began transferring ownership of several branch lines and subsidiaries back to a newly created holding company. During this time, a group of new investors and career railroad men began operating the line and purchased full rights to the DTNI name and image from Canadian National. Locomotives would again wear orange and brightly display the Starburst logo. The Compass, Ford Era Herald, and Block Letter logos were also purchased and occasionally used on freight cars or as paint patches. As current ownership settled in, the DTNI saw another major growth spurt in 2004. That year, the company acquired the Ohio Central Railroad, giving it an Eastern Ohio foothold and access to Pittsburgh. At the same time, the Chessie's Midland subdivision, which was already being used from Washington Courthouse to Cincinnati, was directly purchased, giving a new link for the lines east of Columbus with the rest of the system. To expedite moves from Eastern Ohio, the DTNI extended its trackage rights on Conrail from Springfield to Cincinnati to include Columbus to London, where they rebuilt the former Pennsylvania line to South Charleston to connect back into their main line. Next, the former Pennsylvania Railroad line from Crestline, Ohio to Blue Island, Illinois was purchased in an agreement with Conrail, Norfolk Southern, and Canadian Pacific. 
the three railroads would use the line as a relief line when needed, and any new business was to go to the DTNI. In the same agreement, the DTNI took over Triple Crown operations from Norfolk Southern and Conrail between Detroit, Crestline, Cincinnati, and Fort Wayne. The last major mileage acquisition, and arguably the most important to date, is the purchase of the former B&O from Cincinnati to East St. Louis. In an agreement with the Chessie system, the DTNI would take over the remaining through freight and local operations while Chessie retains trackage rights from Louisville to Cincinnati via the Louisville and Indiana Railroad. Any new business would go to the DTNI as far as Cincinnati, where it would be open to bid for other destinations. In more recent times, the DTNI has expanded its presence in eastern Ohio and in Pennsylvania. The DTNI took over the former Conrail lines between Weirton, Pennsylvania and Powhatan Point, Ohio, including coal mines in the area. Additionally, the DTNI obtained trackage rights from Crestline to Massillon over Conrail's former PRR Fort Wayne line. At Massillon, a connecting track between the former PRR and the former Ohio Central was realigned to host bigger and faster trains. This gives the DTNI a far more efficient Pittsburgh to Detroit or Pittsburgh to Chicago routing. An agreement between the Wheeling and Lake Erie and the DTNI saw trackage rights granted from Jewett, Ohio to Rookyard near Pittsburgh. The Wheeling and Lake Erie and the DTNI jointly operate these trains. The Wheeling routing offers a second route into Pittsburgh for the DTNI, while the Wheeling and Lake Erie benefits with a more direct Chicago routing for its trains. These agreements and acquisitions were not without their growing pains. The DTNI found itself short on yard space. Several projects were started to help alleviate this. First, an auto sort center was built on the former Erie Lackawanna, east of Lima. All automotive traffic on the system goes here for sorting. From Lima, several trains depart in every direction with blocks of this traffic for each railroad that we connect with. Next, the company made a significant investment in the intermodal terminal in Jeffersonville to handle trains coming from the Southern Pacific and the Canadian Pacific. The modern DTNI has solidified itself as a major regional carrier for Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and surrounding states. Solid and efficient partnerships have formed to create quick interchange points with other major carriers. Several lines see bridge traffic daily from Class 1 railroads, CTC is maintained across the PRR from Crestline to Blue Island, as well as the entire B&O from Clarksburg to East St. Louis. All main lines are cleared for double stack traffic and a 40 mile per hour speed limit is generally maintained. Scenic and Taurus subsidiaries have grown to include the Summit Hill Scenic Railway, the Hocking Valley Scenic Railway, the Traverse City Dinner Train, the Cincinnati Dinner Train, and the Byesville Scenic Railway. Besides automotive traffic, the DTNI is a major carrier of chemicals, coal, coke, soybeans, corn, steel, lumber, scrap and landfill material, and frozen foods. The railroad and its team continue to provide excellent, cost-effective service for the region, and the future looks bright. Now you know a little more about the modern DTNI universe. I work in tandem with a lot of other modelers who have modern concepts such as Southern Pacific, the Burlington, Conrail, Chessy, DWP, Sioux Line, and Seaboard. All these together create some fun routing prospects which can help model traffic on our layouts. Most of this is in writing over on our Facebook page and I would encourage you to check that out for reference. Please let me know if you have any additional questions that I can address. Up next in the series, we'll look at how some of the concepts discussed today are applied to the actual layout, as well as some insight into location designs. Until then, happy railroading!